Hello, hello, what is up, what is good, and welcome to my TIFF 2023 video. Uh, we finished up our time with the festival yesterday, which was, of course, the last day of the festival anyways. And uh, this year was kind of a clusterfuck. <laughs> uh, I've only been going to TIFF for two years now, and you might think it's way too soon for me to be griping and complaining, um, given that it's only my second year, and for all I know, things have been way worse before, but... I'm gonna complain anyways. Uh, it was a lot harder to get tickets for screening this this year due to, I think, some poor judgment on TIFF's part. Essentially, we're in the middle of a big screen actors guild strike, so a lot of the big stars that typically TIFF expects to show up and walk the red carpet and do press and stuff weren't gonna be attending, and I think because of that, they decreased the number of screenings, uh, anticipating less interest. But of course, I think a lot of festival goers aren't really interested in that whole star-studded celebrity aspect and are just there for the movies, and then we're fighting over way fewer screenings. Uh, they also made some very strange choices in terms of ticket distribution among various levels. Pretty much all these choices benefited the rich guy over the little guy. Uh, we were unfortunately the little guy this year and uh, had to fight tooth and nail to get to the films that we, we managed to see. Excuse me. I think maybe some of this is as well due to uh, anticipation next year when Bell is pulling out as their primary sponsor, which is going to create a gigantic income hole for them that I have no idea how they're planning on filling. But this sort of like anti-consumerist pro-money grubber strategy is, is going to probably become par for the course. Uh, I also saw a lot of scalping this year. I, I was told that TIFF has always had a problem with scalpers, uh, but this year it seemed very excessive, and then, you know, that's just another force that you're competing with, trying to see uh, get tickets. Not just people that actually want to see the film, but uh, people who are just looking to resell. Also, extremely bafflingly, last year everything was assigned seating, which is great and lovely, and you can show up, you know, right on time and feel secure that you're going to get the seat that you booked. Uh, now, I don't know what benefit this could possibly have to anyone, but a lot of screenings are made general admission. Um, I guess maybe to help things sell out, like probably at a certain point, once all the good seats are taken, a lot of screenings then sell no subsequent tickets. So maybe that's the motivation, but it just creates so many problems. You have to line up so early and then all of these people being lined up, uh, hour, half an hour, whatever, beforehand, creates all sorts of other logistical problems and traffic jams and stuff. So I don't know what the hell they're doing. I was very disappointed with pretty much every festival decision this year. Um, also, on a cultural mimetic level, uh, you may remember in the last video, I talked about how before every screening, they show the same set of ads. And then as the festival went on, certain memes were developed among festival goers of call and response with the ads or, or clapping along to certain songs or whatever. And I, I don't really remember what I said last year, but I, I can kind of remember feeling like a little bit positive on these. Like I thought it was kind of neat to witness the sort of cultural meme be born before my eyes from screening to screening. Uh, this year it was just dire. <laughs> uh, I, I don't know if it's just because the novelty wore off. Uh, pretty much all the ads were the same. Um, I don't know if it was that they couldn't film new ones due to actor strikes or just budgetary concerns or what, but a lot of the old memes just clung on this year. And I mean, even the best memes are lucky if they last more than a few months, let alone a year. Uh, so I don't know. It was also maybe the screenings we went to. We went to a lot of the Midnight Madness screenings where the crowd is usually a lot more enthusiastic for stuff like this to begin with, but, oh, I was just so sick of it. So quickly I became so sick of it. It was just so obnoxious and devoid of intellect and uh, really started to make me dread, especially those midnight screenings, getting through the ads with just the most obnoxious wannabe comedians in the world repeating the same jokes and, and trying to one-up uh, something that was already very annoying and can only get more annoying. Anyways... None of that matters, though. What actually matters is the films. And despite all of these complaints about availability and stuff, we saw 12 films. We saw 11 fantastic films. And I'm going to talk about them now. 
Uh, I didn't prepare, you know, in-depth slides about these. If I had the time, I would have liked to write out some points and really articulate a thesis about each of these films, um, as I am typically want to do when discussing media, but uh, I just don't have time. I'm, I'm just going to do this all off the dome and talk about what I remembered and what stood out to me and what I liked about them. And then for the ones that I really liked, I will be doing, of course, at the end of the year, like a year in sort of retrospective, that'll probably be like top 15 movies. Um, and the, the good ones will make it, of course, to that list and be explored a little more in depth. Okay, uh, the first one I want to talk about is Kill. This was one of the Midnight Madness screenings we saw. It kicked the festival off in amazing style, just a perfect example of the sort of movie it wants to be. Uh, I'm, I'm gonna get into like the plot of these movies. I, I don't think it'll be like spoilers. There's not gonna be a discussion of like consequence of the twists or the pivotal moments or things like that, but much more just the premise and the tone and you know, hopefully that'll give you a sense of, of whether or not you'd enjoy it once it becomes more widely available. So this was an Indian movie, very much in the vein of The Raid, um, like that very brutal, kinetic, uh, choreographed martial arts type stuff. Uh, extremely gory and violent and brutal, uh, as suggested by the name Kill. Uh, it all takes place on a train, this very like tight, claustrophobic fighting and setting um, with a great kind of self-built structuring, like a very internal consistent structuring of like moving through the car carriages of the train and encountering enemies and situations and stuff. Uh, so basically this dude has got to kill a whole lot of bandits on this train and he does so in, in gloriously uh, bloody style. Um, what I think I was most impressed with this movie is just the, 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 it's like very over the top and excessive and very powerful in being so and compelling, but it, it also felt kind of real in that he wasn't just getting off scot-free, the, the people attacking him weren't kind of doing your typical martial arts thing of like taking turns to just get thrown, um, instead, it just was, like, this brutal fight where, like, people were really taking damage and, and getting beat up and then, like, you know, carrying those wounds forward. Uh, there was such a good sense of, like, the, the mooks that he was killing, having, like, a personality and having a backstory and having all these connections to each other. Like, they grieve each other. They're this big family of bandits. They're always crying when they discover the corpse of another cousin or brother or uncle. Um, and although you don't really sympathize with them, you really do want to see all these bastards bleat and buddy, bloody to a pulp, but, like, it just adds, like, another layer of emotional depth and, like, realism. Very, very impressed with this one. It was a ton of fun. The audience was hooting and hollering at all the big kills. It was so cathartic and satisfying. Uh, definitely would watch this again. Looking forward to it getting a wider release. I think this could be a real cult classic. <sighs> Next day, we went back at midnight to watch Boy Kills World. Um, these midnight ones are always at the Royal Alexandra Theatre, which is a beautiful old theater right in downtown Toronto. Uh, it has three tiers of seating. It's been used in the past for stage performances and orchestral performances and such too. On this day, we had to climb all the flights of stairs to get up to the very tippy top, and it was not worth it because this movie was a big stinker. Um, I would say the most interesting thing about this movie is that before it started, um, they played the song Moom. Uh, no, sorry, they played the song K slash Half Noise by the band Moom, uh, which is one of my favorite musical acts of all time that put out two of my favorite albums of all time and that I never, ever, ever would have considered it possible to encounter in a public space. So that was very surreal. That was really cool. Definitely the highlight of the whole evening. And then the actual film started and it was a huge stinker. Just the most obnoxious, annoying movie I've ever had the displeasure of seeing in a theater and sitting all the way through and not watching as some like intentionally bad thing. Uh, it was very disappointing because the premise sounds kind of neat. It's about a 
uh, deaf and uh, unspeaking guy who is raised in the jungle by this shaman to be like a revolutionary fighter and to go kill the leaders of the super fascist controlling political party. Uh, not really solely uh, original, but, you know, something that sounds like it could be a lot of fun. Something that seems tailor-made for the sort of Midnight Madness screening. Uh, but no, it was just stupid. Uh, so because the guy can't speak, we're treated to a intermittent internal monologue of his thoughts that is uh, quipping and making uh, irreverent observational humor and uh, basically committing every single sin of any action movie in this post-Whedon, post-Harmon era where nothing can ever be taken seriously, and instead you just have to make uh, a, a collection of extremely unwitty, uninteresting jokes um, at the expense of everything that's actually going on. Uh, just really excruciating on that level. I just wish that I I would go deaf and dumb. <laughs> um, it's It's got, like, twists and stuff, but all of them are, like, really stupid and unearned. Um, some of, like, the set design was okay. It, it did feel like they had a lot of ideas about this, this world and wanted to kind of, like, build something expansive, but all of it very much felt flat because the cinematography was so uninteresting and all of the action shots were just, like, this disorienting mess of, like, swirling and whooshing around camera angles and, uh, basically, like, it, it really felt to me like this was a movie made by someone who doesn't watch movies but instead just watches like shonen anime and has learned all the wrong rules for how to compose action and stuff and and takes things that have sort of a sakuga appeal in animation and just spams them with the ease of being able to move a physical camera um to no effect whatsoever uh, yeah, a deeply, deeply obnoxious movie um, was not worth climbing all those stairs. Definitely was not worth the ticket price. Uh, this is this is a great sin uh, that South Africa has committed onto the world, adding to their long list of existing sins from white Africans, white South Africans. That is, uh, yeah, very embarrassing. Uh, let's just move on. Ah, a banger! Here we go. Agro Drift. This is another Midnight Madness one. Uh, directed, created um, by Harmony Korain. Directed seems like maybe the wrong word. Um, Harmony Korain, of course, a very like cult favorite director who's made a lot of pretty unapproachable and often kind of like repulsive and offensive cinema. Kids, gummo, uh, trash humpers. Uh, the titles themselves have this kind of nauseating aura. Uh, most recently, I think he made his biggest waves with Spring Breakers. I say most recently, but that was like 10 years ago. He's made a few things since then, but I haven't seen them. Um, but it's it's really hard to kind of like summarize his style or his aims or sensibilities as a director. But somehow in watching this experience, watching this audiovisual thing, I felt like I connected with him on a level that I had never done before. Uh, so this is a 90-ish minutes, maybe even shorter than that, um, exploration, an audiovisual exploration of certain visual ideas and concepts and spaces. Uh, it's all shot in infrared, which I have never really seen before as like a filmic style. Um, it, it seems like maybe that would be gimmicky, but he uses it in such, like, a creative, inspired, deliberate way. Um, like, really composing all these shots such that they'll be very interesting when viewed through the infrared lens. I remember a very early scene where a guy is just kind of, like, idly waving around a knife. And in certain uh, angles, the knife, because of, I guess, the reflective qualities of it or something shows up like bright yellow on the infrared spectrum and then at other times it dips down into like a deep red that's not that different from the the character itself so it kind of like goes invisible 
And I remember as soon as I saw that, I was just like, all right, <laughs> I see I see what you're doing here. Like it's it's kind of all the novelty is of filming in color for the first time or even just filming for the first time in terms of like what sort of shots are interesting on just this raw, like visceral level of just being dazzled and entertained by images on the screen. Um, really trying to explore that, really trying to come up with like a new cinematic language. And oh man, the, the number of shots that just like gripped me on that pure aesthetic level, like the, the opening shot where uh, a man is sitting in a pool and it's raining and it just looks like bubbling lava and it just has this like immediate like grip on your eyes. And then in terms of the actual content, it's, it's also very strange and very unique. Um, this, this has been discussed in a lot of interviews with, uh, Mr. Korean about this movie and even in the Q and A after we saw this, that he was mostly inspired by like video games. He was mostly inspired by the way that video game characters like NPCs will move and have kind of like stiff, static, repetitive actions and speak kind of like ambiently the same lines of dialogue over and over again as they kind of wander around waiting to be interacted with. So he kind of like imagines this very video game-esque space, something like out of Grand Theft Auto, but removes the player character so that you're just kind of left wandering as maybe like this unseen camera character, just moving a camera around in first person in the space of a video game that's just sort of running on its own. Um, and it creates this like very kind of distant, haunting, eerie sensation, like watching these characters move uncontrolled uh, based on these like very simple routines. Um, what it reminded me of most is this YouTube account called Saint, uh, also known in some circles as Saint Timmy, who plays like a lot of really obscure kind of cultish, often quite creepy uh, early PC games. Uh, well, I guess I shouldn't say early PC games, but like <laughs> in my life, the early games, like ones that were made in the late 90s and early 2000s, uh, stuff that kind of evokes feelings of what video games were when I was a child, but still retains like a lot of like mystery and just inexplicable things. And you're like not really sure tonally where it's going to go. Is it going to get like violent or whatever? Um, and watching those videos, I'm, I'm gripped with this like fascinated, haunting feeling um, that I had never really encountered anywhere besides those videos until now. Watching Agro Drift gave me that same sensation of just, like, peering at this inexplicable relic and, like, not really understanding what purpose it served or how far it's going to go, but, like, knowing that there was something there, that there was this, like, deep intent. And, and I feel like that feeling, being having that feeling evoked was, like, very deliberate on the part of Harmony Korine. Um, such that, like, I really feel like, again, I, I, like, understand him on, like, a deep level, like, not that it was made just for me or something like that, but it was made to evoke a feeling that I thought was, like, very rare, that was, like, a very niche, precious feeling in my own life, and to let it kind of, like, fully bloom and be explored on screen. So many other cool things I could talk about. Uh, the use of AI in order to um, apply like weird generative, always shifting filters on top of stuff was like super novel and something that I'm like really, really excited for just in the future of cinema in general. And this sort of like experimental audiovisual stuff. Um, I, I think the messaging of the film, this idea of it's about like a hitman, he's the world's greatest assassin. Um, trying to reconcile the violence and danger of his profession with the love and serenity he feels at his home life where he has a wife and kids. Um, just like all of these like weirdly contrasting shots that are then kind of united in terms of like just the raw visual language. I don't know. I, I, Harmony Korine referred to this as like something that's beyond film. I, he said I was, I was bored of making movies. I wanted to come up with something that was like after movies. And that sounds like a very bold statement, but I, I think watching things like this makes you realize how limited our scope is of what is like audiovisual entertainment, like how 
transfixed we are onto the idea of a narrative of characters, of a simulacra of real life as things that are kind of like requisite to have a sensible movie that we are watching. And that there is so many like liminal spaces and new spaces and what can be accomplished with visuals and audio uh, that lie in between your, your narrative live action feature and something like the Windows Media Player visualizer. Like <laughs> there's a gigantic ocean of possibilities in media that we have only explored a few tiny islands that stick out of when there is a, a gigantic sprawling landmass underneath that we need to dive down into. By the way, the music was amazing. I, I would love to get the soundtrack for this. It was done by Arab Music, who I've been listening to for like 10 years now. I only, I only thought... We used to call it like spamming tech skill music. He gets one of those like little uh, sample pads and just like drills the hell out of it. And it sounds awesome. Um, but this was like a whole new mode for him. And it was like so cinematic and entrancing and emotionally powerful. I, I was amazed. This is a one of a kind thing. <laughs> There's nothing else I've seen that's like this. It is so amazing to be as deep into weird shit as I am <laughs> to be as obsessive over finding extreme things as I am and to still be like blown away by the sheer novelty of something. Okay. Moving on though, cause we got a lot more to cover. Uh, Hitman, another Hitman movie. Uh, this was a kind of dark rom-com directed by the legendary Richard Linklater who came out and did a little meet and greet and Q and a, uh, he sounds like Owen Wilson uh, this movie was great. It was very, very funny, uh, very charming. Um, it had like a great sense of pacing and of like very good sequence based directing that it's it's almost kind of like multiple episodes where we, we kind of have a little arc in this character's development and a new situation occurring and then not quite a resolution, but definitely like a good directorial uh, edge that like I, I don't know if I can explain this very well but I'm, what I'm trying to say is that it was very perfectly paced um, to just kind of be both comfy and have this really good sense of forward momentum um, I, I want to make a special call out to the fact that this movie was like genuinely like sexy and like uh, flirtatious and like had a sense of like chemistry between the two leads that I haven't felt watching a movie in a long ass time. And and that's like one of Licklater's specialties, but like, I don't know, it's, I just become so used to seeing a couple on screen and they're supposed to be like flirting and making banter and being like sexy with each other. And it's just sort of like, all right, I get what the point of this is. And at best it's like not offensive. But here I was just like, damn, oh, they're so good for each other. And I don't know, I was like very impressed with that. I, I didn't think movies could really... Uh, hit me on that level all that often anymore. So yeah, very, very happy with this. Um, I would watch it again. It's a lot of fun. I think it'll have a lot of uh, wide appeal. It's a, it's a movie that I think a lot of people could enjoy. Um, don't have too much else to say about it. We'll move on to The Promised Land. A completely different genre of film. A huge Norwegian, no, Danish epic <laughs> about um, the Danish royalty's attempts to tame the hearth, which was this huge sprawling expanse in northern Denmark of land considered too arid to farm in, um, typically run by bandits, um, you know, a very inhospitable place. Our main man, Mads Mikkelsen, in another fantastic role, um, playing a very complex, somewhat heroic, somewhat detestable, uh, extremely hard-edged man, uh, sets out to conquer the hearth and to prove that it can be farmed, and in doing so, make himself uh, a place in the nobility. Uh, he is in contention with this guy over here that I'm sure just from the poster you can tell is a, an absolute prick who claims that he personally has right to this land um, and does everything in his power, both legal and extra legal, to force Mads to pack up and leave. Uh, this 
spirals into a huge sprawling war between the two that unfolds over I feel like this movie was really long but maybe it was only about two hours um, but it just feels long it has that real epic feeling of just more and more stuff happening uh, very stirring movie very rousing like you you felt very passionately towards the characters and wanting to see justice and feeling outraged and you know, suffering alongside them as crops fail and weather turns poor and then triumphing with them. I almost teared up when they first saw the little sprout growing in the soil. Um, it's got some really violent, cathartic moments that feel great. Um, I don't know. I, I don't have too much to say bad about this. It, it just... It's like, it is what it is. <laughs> There's not, like, much in the way of, like, comedy or charm uh, or personality kind of outside of just the story it's telling. Um, I think thematically it asks a lot of questions about the duties one has and, you know, being able to transcend them in order to be truer to yourself and, and what do you really want out of life anyways, like what what reward will you get for staying in line is that really worth it if you have to sacrifice all these other things but it's not like those questions are really all that interesting like they're sort of interesting in the world where this uh story exists but kind of in the modern day they just sort of feel a little unnuanced i guess because it's like obvious to us what the characters should be doing um but no still still very satisfying loved to see some rich pricks get their comeuppance what more could you want in life than seeing rich pricks get their comeuppance? <laughs> okay, moving on. Uh, Wildcat. This is a pretty low-res poster. I don't even know if this is the official poster, but whatever. Uh, this is a biopic um, kind of abstracted adaptation of the works and life of Flannery O'Connor, who was a fervently Catholic... Um, very feminist and progressive writer from like the the 50s uh originally operating out of the deep south and living in new york for a stint and then ultimately having to return to the south to her family's uh home because of uh the onset of severe lupus uh a very heartbreaking film in a lot of ways because it really shows the impact of that disease and how brutal it was for her life and how she essentially feels like fighting severely uphill at all times to realize her great ambitions of becoming a writer and becoming uh, notable and expressing herself and expressing all these deep feelings that she has within herself and, and not being lonely and, and finding love and finding connection. Uh, it's, it's very bitterly sad in that way. Um, but I, I think, you know... It's, it's like one of those movies where it's like someone suffers a lot, perhaps by their own choices, but they accomplish something transcendentally amazing in doing so, usually something like artistic. Um, and then the audience is just kind of left to wonder, like, was it worth it then? Like, would it have been better were it an option for her to choose happiness were that happiness even possible or even if she had the choice would she prefer to have suffered like this in service of creating something great i think any um story that like puts that question in the spotlight and really meaningfully digs into the relationship between the suffering and the art and what the art actually is and means to that person and and what they are giving up by pursuing it i think anything that can really grasp onto that and say something meaningful about it will always affect me very 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 deeply and this was no exception um i was really impressed with how it was shot uh it it creates this sort of like uh literary mindset that I've felt before when I'm very manic <laughs> and and I think um, is is kind of the mode that a lot of writers when they're really operating and formulating stories and stuff are operating in where you kind of observe everything as if it was the seeds to a story 
And while you're still participating in real life, in your mind, you're autopiloting a lot of stuff and like 90% of your brain is now just germinating that seed of an idea that you picked up from anywhere. And this movie, I think, represents, represents this like tremendously well. Uh, using actual short stories from Flannery O'Connor's oeuvre. Um, it'll be a scenario where she sees, say, uh, a one-armed man sitting at a train station. And then for the next few sequences, everything is intercut with scenes from, like, a story that she's kind of writing in her mind. Um, and you kind of see, bit by bit, like, other influences, like, shifting in and... Even little things like, even if it's not a full blown cut out of the diegesis to show a story that's happening in her mind, there's just certain little camera tricks and stuff that really shows like, what is she focusing on? Like, what is standing out to her in situations she's observing? What lines echo in her head um, that really kind of just capture, I think, in a very beautiful, empathetic way, the literary process kind of like repeatedly unfolding and building itself up in her head. Um, I really liked how all the short stories were shot. I, I thought they just did a tremendous job going all out. Um, it had this very like dreamlike feel where a lot of characters that are in the real world, um, or a lot of actors, sorry, that play characters in the real world, play different characters in the short story, again, suggesting the inspirations and suggesting how she's like formulating these characters in her mind. Um, but it really kind of creates this disorienting feeling when, when it's cuts to one of these story sections. It takes you a little bit to even get up to speed with like what is happening and therefore m what must be happening in the real world and who these people are. Oh, they're just characters within characters now. And I don't know. I was, I was very, very impressed with this. I don't think it's like a perfect movie. Uh, I think in terms of like the actual like direction and cinematography and performances... Uh, it wasn't, like, the most mind-blowing thing. It's more just, like, conceptually, the ideas that it dives into, the type of story that it's telling, and uh, just the, the way this, like, literary feel is portrayed is really, really impressive. Um, so, I don't know. It's... it's I, I think it's, like, very ambitious in a way that I really expect, even if it fails to live up to uh, all of those ambitions in the highest quality that it could have. Okay, next we saw At Midnight Again, a horror movie called When Evil Lurks. Um, this was an Argentinian movie, the first Argentinian movie to play during the Midnight Madness block, uh, which got a huge round of applause and many people shouting out in Spanish and stuff, which is always endearing. Uh, so this is a kind of demonic possession type story, but it goes in quite a few interesting directions. Uh, first off, it takes place in a world where demonic possession is kind of like a bad sickness. And it's treated somewhat scientifically, and people are, like, aware of it. And when these people encounter it, it's not so much that they're shocked that it's happening, um, but they're just so confused that it's happened in their remote little village. So this is something that happens in the city. And through very nicely integrated, very subtle world building, you kind of learn that the, the world is in a, a state of despair where um, it's like a matter of fact that these sorts of demonic possessions exist. Um, but there's no kind of like religious counterforce to it. Uh, they say a few times, well, the era of churches is over. Um, so nobody is like religious in a good way. It's like only the bad parts of the Bible turned out to be real. Which I just think is like really cool world building. Um, and they did a great job of not having the world building get in the way of the movie. Uh, I think often when I realize that a horror movie I'm watching is taking place in this sort of alternate world where all the characters like know a bunch of stuff we don't. I expect that a lot of the tension is going to be based around like those rules and stuff. Um, which to me is just sort of like weak <laughs> and not that interesting and makes a lot of stuff kind of play out formulaically. Um, whereas here they, they have this sort of world building and stuff, but it's, uh, just sort of for your own intrigue. It's just sort of to spark your imagination and all of the confrontations and actual scenes of drama and despair and violence, 
um, aren't just kind of like, oh, well, yeah, that's what they said in the rules, but instead just something that is very horrific on its own. Uh, and there are some really horrific images in this one. It's a very mean and distasteful movie in a way that I found very engrossing and satisfying. Uh, just great atmospheric work, a great sense of dread. Um, I loved that in most cases the characters weren't really in like immediate physical danger. It was more just this very ominous sense of like they could do something wrong, like they could make some mistake that would evoke violence onto them. Um, so many situations where people are, are kind of like uh, in control of the situation but so overwhelmed by the emotions of the situation that, you know, they, they act foolishly or against their own interests or, I don't know, just like very grounded in humanity despite having this, this fantastical aspects to it. Uh, just really great, like subtle characterization, nothing being like beaten over your head uh, to, to try to tell you, oh, this is the type of story you're seeing, but really allowing the audience to like discover on their own um, how bad things are gonna get. Really, really, really impressed with this one. It's the director's first film, I think. Sky's the limit, great stuff. Ooh, and then we saw in IMAX the 4K restoration of the, the greatest concert movie of all time. As the poster indicates, I don't know if I would have said that so boldly before I saw this. You know, the, the last waltz by the band is also worth a consideration. Uh, but after I saw this, yeah, I, I was blown away. Um, if you're a Talking Heads fan, I'm sure you've already seen this or are aware of it. But I, if you're not a Talking Heads fan... I really urge you to watch this and tell me what you think because I was talking about this with my dad after I saw it and I told him, oh my God, just seeing it in the theaters was so amazing. It's like, how does this appear to people that aren't familiar with the band? You have this weird, quirked up white boy doing strange seizure mood moves and sprinting around on the stage in a, a total flop sweat and then more and more musicians just keep piling in seemingly pulled from different bands with whole different aesthetics and styles, each contributing something totally unique, but perfectly integrated into this like overwhelming, catchy, funky groove. And then David Byrne still on top of that, just manic, the most energized person you've ever seen on screen, blasting out some of the hugest, biggest ideas and lyrics and just the most it feels like it's scratching your brain inside out the, the rhythms and stuff to it i was so blown away seeing this in theater i, I actually like cried for parts of it just because it's like god they're just killing it <laughs> it's it's i don't know i've I always loved the talking heads ever since my dad introduced them to me when i was a little kid and i've i've always found some of their songs to just be permanently lodged in my head and just seeing it all together like this on the big, big IMAX screen, like now as an adult, uh, having internalized the lyrics for so long, but only now like really feeling them, like it was, it was an experience like no other. Um, it's gonna get a wider IMAX release. Please go see it. I, I think you will have a blast, even if you've never heard a Talking Hog Head song before in your life. Um, yeah, I have nothing but good things to say. I don't know. Then, uh, very, very early the next morning, we went to go see The Boy and the Heron, which is the latest by uh, the legendary Miyazaki, working with Studio Ghibli. Uh, his manyth movie after vowing retirement. This one has been in the works since like 2016, I think. So obviously there was a ton of anticipation. Um, I would say it lives up to the hype insofar as it is very much a Miyazaki movie. The production quality is phenomenal. Uh, everything is so gorgeously animated, so visually compelling. Uh, every shot is just an absolute delight. There is nothing that is like phoned in or by default or anything. Everything from small slice of life moments to the most fantastical worlds to the most charming characters to the most serene kind of wizened moments 
Uh, everything just is a visual, audio-visual delight. The soundtrack is phenomenal, too. Uh, it differs a lot from another, a lot of other Miyazaki movies. His movies are always full of just kind of, like, strangeness and mystery, like, whimsical things and things that um, you're not maybe sure of the, the significance of right away. Um, but they're always, like, very emotionally anchored and with, like, a very clear through line of, like, cause and effect. Um, to, to varying extents. I don't know. Like, Castle in the Sky gets pretty abstract. <laughs> Howl's Moving Castle. Sometimes you, you wonder what something means, maybe. But um, what, what my boyfriend pointed out is that usually these movies have female protagonists that are very, like, emotionally open and very really emotionally connected to the viewer. Uh, whereas here our protagonist is a young man who's, well, a young man, he's like 13. Uh, he's very stoic. He's very reserved. It's like quite unscrutable sometimes what his objective is or, or how he's feeling about the events that are unfolding around him. Um, so it has like a much more mysterious feel in terms of kind of like its emotional messaging, like how we're meant to feel about different developments and stuff. Um, there's there's a very like visceral emotional level where you're just kind of swept up in everything. But in another sense, I was I was really just asking myself like what what did he mean by this? Like what was this supposed to convey about Miyazaki's extremely passionate and opinionated worldview? Or uh, what is this supposed to reflect on the the human condition? Or how does this relate to Japan during war times or the immediate after war period where it's set? Um, so I think, I don't know, maybe also because it was very early in the morning and I was like sore and cold and stuff, but I, it just didn't like grip me in the same way where I felt like I was uncovering something very important about myself as well. It was more just sort of seeing something from a distance and not really being able to discern exactly its shape. It reminded me most of Shakespeare's The Tempest, and I don't want to spoil too much and go into specifically why. Um, but I really feel like this was written, even though Miyazaki, of course, went do to do I guess I'm not retired after all, I think I'll make one more. I think while he was making this, he did sincerely believe this would be the last one. Just like The Tempest is Shakespeare's last play. And I think that informs the messaging in a way that is probably very deeply personal to him, that I might not be able to totally grasp, but it has this very lingering sentimentality through everything that I found quite moving. Okay. Then at midnight that night, we saw a Korean horror movie called Sleep. Uh, this is the first movie by its director, who was previously a protege of uh, Bong, Bong Joon... Bong... I shouldn't have tried saying his name. I, bong... You know, Parasite Man. Um, <laughs> and you can really tell he has learned a lot from his, uh, his, his, I was going to say sensei, but it's Korean. <laughs> his, uh, this, this advisor and advocate, um, this movie, I think, has the same really perfect balance of suspense, comedy, some horrific elements, um... Dude, is this, I, I want to look at his name. <laughs> this is really going to bug me. <laughs> uh, doo -doo -doo. Bong Joon-ho. <laughs> Sorry, I was distracting myself because I was like... I, I may have been remembering any part of it correctly. Anyways, yeah. I, I think this strikes a really ex excellent genre balance. Um, it's the story of a man who begins sleepwalking at night and committing some kind of disturbing uh, uh, acts around the house. Um, his wife, who is very pregnant and is about to give birth soon, um, at first kind of reasonably uh, is concerned for the baby's safety with a sleepwalking man around, um, but then this spirals more and more into her own paranoia and fear. Um, I think the movie does a fantastic job, like, focalizing through her such that you start to lose your perception of, like, what is actually dangerous and, like, what is real, like, what things are actually connected um, in a way that I, I found extremely gripping. And just the, the fact that 
nothing supernatural was happening and that say like my boyfriend that night could start sleepwalking and how freaked out I might be and like <laughs> how how ill-equipped I felt to um handle that situation uh it was like this weird thing where even though the movie was obviously exaggerated and uh portrayed like risks and fears that weren't part of my life the small seed that could have overlapped with my life just bloomed in my head to this like really terrifying scenario that was so in parallel to plausible events I don't know if I'm making any sense here. I'm kind of rambling, but like it just really nicely struck a chord with me in terms of just being just enough relatable that I was like, I could end up like that lady. <laughs> there, there doesn't need to be anything supernatural or impossible involved and I could end up like this lady. Um, yeah, yeah, just a really excellent film. I was so impressed with it. I, I don't want to spoil the ending, but it's maybe my favorite ending of anything we saw uh, all uh, festival uh, it was oddly very heartwarming to me. <laughs> uh, yeah, check this one out. I think it could be a big cult hit once it gets a wider release. Uh, then we saw Gonzo Girl. This is actually the poster or cover of the paperback novel on which it was based. Um, but this is what they had on Letterboxd, so I used it as well. I don't think there is an official poster. Uh, so this is the semi-fictionalized um, story of Huster, Hunter S. Thompson's assistant during a period in the 90s when he was hopelessly attempting to write another novel. Uh, things weren't really going so well with for him at the time. He had really faded away from a lot of cultural relevance, uh, but he was still kind of an underworld hero and commanded this almost cult following in his compound where she shows up originally quite naive and thinking she's going to make a big change in his life and instead really gets swept up in this chaotic party of cocaine and acid and booze. Uh, it was, it was uh, a lot of fun at first. <laughs> uh, as you can maybe expect, things get a little hairy, as uh, the Hunter S. Thompson proxy says. Um, but... At the start, I think it was one of the best depictions of taking hallucinogenics and partying and uh, just the sort of big party feeling and, and how it feels to be like tripping in those situations. Uh, uh, not, that, not that I'm speaking from experience, I can only speculate, um, but it sure felt very realistic. <laughs> um, very small things stood out to me as, as being, like, authentic and very empathetic in a way. Uh, and then, you know, as things got a little more severe and dire, that was very captivating, too, because you really come to like these characters. Uh, even Hunter S. Thompson being the instigator of all these problems and someone who's obviously very deeply dysfunctional. Uh, I still found myself really empathizing with him. I think I, the the movie does a very good job of this, where they don't shy away from his monstrous qualities, and you you empathize with the assistant character kind of through that lens, but at the same time you understand why she adores him and why she was such a fan and why he continued to have fans. You see these flickers of his brilliance that I think come across... Uh, very sincerely and and very convincingly, um, largely because of the performance of Willem Dafoe, who plays the Hunter S. Thompson proxy and does an amazing job, one of the best performances I've seen of him, which is saying a whole lot, uh, just perfectly capturing this like weird laid back intensity. I think I said capturing too, capturing his intensity. I've been talking for too long. Blah, 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 blah. We're almost done. Um, <laughs> it, it really was an amazing performance. I, I felt myself kind of hypnotized by him. And yet, you never forget that he's just kind of like a beat-up, coke-addict old man either. Uh, so yeah, quite a good movie. Uh, I think, you know, it's not flawless. Um, there was a few things that didn't quite feel totally justified to me in like the rhetoric, kind of like character behaviors or... Leaps between scenes that just sort of felt a little arbitrary. Um, but, you know, it's like based on a true story. And that's just how real life is sometimes. It's chaotic and arbitrary and unjustified. 
Um, which is, you know, and that is how it is. But in terms of watching a movie, sometimes it kind of takes you out of it when you go, huh? <laughs> really? Okay. <laughs> um, but yeah, a good time. And then finally, yesterday we saw Evil Does Not Exist. The latest film by Ryusuke Hamaguchi, who directed Drive My Car, a movie that I put at number one of my 2022 list, even though it came out in 2021, because I watched it in 2022, and it affected me emotionally so much that I completely uprooted my life and made some of the most major decisions uh, I've made um, in response to it. Uh, a movie that uh, deeply, deeply impacted my soul and resonated with it. Um, and I think in my, my overflowing of praise for it, and it is a movie I deeply love, um, I didn't discuss uh, enough and um, the, the things I didn't like about it. <laughs> and there were, you know, quite a few things that I didn't like about it. It's just that they were so overwhelmed by the stuff that I loved about it um, and spread across a four hour runtime. Those flaws, you know, aren't that significant to me. Um, but I do think it's kind of interesting the ways in which it was flawed. And then even better, the ways in which this movie contains none of those flaws. <laughs> um, I, I think without Murakami involved in the writing process to add some more, I don't know, extreme or shock, shocking or twisty type things that you see all the time in Murakami's books, uh, Hamaguchi on his own writes a lot more humanly and realistically and kind of down to earth. Uh, there is one moment... Uh, there's, there's a few things. I, I talked about my, to my boyfriend about this at length, but, um, essentially if you look at Hamaguchi's career, he was kind of this like critical darling in Japan where he was putting out, uh, five, six hour long movies that were beloved by a certain subset of critics, but never really captured all that much attention elsewhere. Uh, someone that you could say was kind of a cult following director. Then Drive My Car comes out at a paltry four hours and becomes this worldwide critical darling and gets him a best foreign picture oscar and gets nominated for the best picture oscar generates all sorts of discussion but in in overall just the tremendous outpouring of love and i think you know no matter how uh artistically true one is no matter how much of an auteur one is uh, it's impossible to not be affected by that sort of success and to kind of carry uh, lessons learned from that into the next movie and I'm not saying that this movie is like pandering to a wider audience it does not feel like that at all um, but I feel like certain choices were made in acknowledgement of the fact that this was going to be shown overseas and get a lot of overseas attention first off it's very short for his standards it's only like an hour and 40 minutes uh, and to me it felt too short <laughs> to me I, I felt having really enjoyed the the pacing of his longer movies, it felt like a lot of sequences here were a little rushed. Not all of them. There was still a lot of really nice long sequences, but um, it felt like in, in a scene that previously he could have spent 10, 15 minutes just sort of dwelling in and allowing you to experience the full range of emotions within. Um, instead, it was kind of a little more functional and kind of like made the key points in order to bring out that mood efficiently. And this is like praise because I think that's very masterfully done. Um, but it made me kind of long for the extended version of those sequences. It made me long to simply exist in this world a little bit more. Um, the Another thing was... I, I, again, I, I'm just sort of rehashing a long conversation I had with my boyfriend. Uh, but there was a scene I found very, very interesting. Uh, so as you can tell from the poster, this mostly takes place in rural Japan. Um, and it follows a man who kind of is a community figure who does various jobs for various people. And on a few occasions, we see him sawing up uh, old um, tree trunks that have fallen and then chopping them into firewood, which is, you know, something I did for hundreds of hours in my childhood. I can get into that later. In fact, I should probably just save some of this stuff for the year-end list, because this is going to be a, a long discretion <laughs> to really get into this movie. Anyways, so there's a very early scene where we would just watch him do this for maybe five minutes or so. 
Maybe it would normally be 15, I don't know, but maybe for five minutes we watch him do it. And then later, there's a scene where uh, some people are observing him do this. And everyone in the audience started laughing. And I was laughing too. And it had this really nice, natural, sitcom-type awkwardness of these people who were waiting to talk to him, just kind of standing there and watching him chop firewood. And it's like, you laugh because you know from the structure of the movie, from seeing that previous scene and from knowing Hamaguchi's reputation, you know that this is going to be a long shot. You know that you're going to be like stuck there with them, watching them watch him cut wood for such an awkwardly long time, knowing that they don't know what to do, what to say, should they interrupt, uh, should they ask how much longer he's going to be. You know, all these, like, very small human things that come out in observing such a situation. Uh, it is funny. It's it's genuinely very funny. But it felt like something he would never have done before. Because it's, like, almost just making a joke out of his own filmic technique. Out of his own sensibility. Uh, not that he's, like, an overly self-serious guy. Not that these movies never had humor before. Especially this very kind of, like, small, awkward human humor. Um, but just like the, the source of the comedy being that we know how he likes to direct, uh, felt very unprecedented for me and very surprising. Uh, and then the last thing that I felt really fell outside of his sensibilities and that I still really don't know how I feel about it was the ending. Of course, I don't want to tell you what happens in the ending, um, but I was very, very surprised by the ending. And then talking to my boyfriend, it turns out we had radically different understandings of what even happened in the ending like what the scenes were depicting um so i don't know i i maybe haven't even decided what i think happens let alone how i feel about it um but it seemed it seemed outside of his sensibilities in a way that i found a little disappointing um because up until then i really did feel like the movie was flawless uh sure i would have liked it to be longer and sure, it feels a little strange that maybe there is now, like, an outside influence of his kind of reputation now folding in and influencing the movie. But that's, like, fine. That's still interesting. And the movie itself is just so fantastically interesting. The, the, the sort of community that it builds up before your eyes and, and the questions that it asks about ecology and stewardship and like true environmentalism like a human-based environmentalism and looking at the long history of like settlement and stuff I, I think it was some of the most fascinating and eye-opening and engrossing discussions around that some of the most beautiful depictions of this rural life that I can ever remember seeing uh, it, it's something that evokes <laughs> the feelings of Yuru camp um, but, you know, in live action in a totally different, like, emotional mode. By the way, this movie almost exists because of Eurocamp. There's a plot point that camping has become much more popular in, like, the last five years in Japan, which is because of Eurocamp. <laughs> and it's unclear if uh, Hamaguchi would have, have chosen this plot otherwise. Um, but yeah, it's, it's like a flawless movie outside of the flaws that I mentioned. It, it perfectly satiates what I'm looking for from this director. Uh, his, his work to me is like Japanese cuisine, like, uh, washoku. Like, it's such a subtle flavor. It's something that you really can't put your finger on. It's not anything extreme. It's not the most blank you've ever had. But it's just like so immaculately balanced. Such this like soft, lingering, delicate flavor it leaves in me. Um, that I, I could just watch for hours and hours and hours on end. Okay. That's it for the slideshow. Let's do a little comparisons. <laughs> so I, I kind of hesitate to do this. I don't know. Uh, throughout the festival, my boyfriend and my, my friend, another friend of ours that attends a lot of these, actually attends a lot more than we do, uh, both of them were just ranking everything or rating everything they saw in Letterboxd. Um, and, you know, I, I had a little bit of FOMO. Like, I was like, oh, I want to be part of this conversation too and, and put my rankings in and then... 
you know, we can discuss, oh, hey, you rank this higher than that. Why'd you like it more? It leads to some fun conversations, but I don't know. I just feel like so, I don't know, like exposed to making letterbox rankings. I think maybe because the rating just sort of stands alone unless you write a review, but then it's like, do I have the time to be writing re these reviews? What reviews do I want to put in it? So instead, I'm going to just make a tier list, <laughs> which for some reason feels a little more agreeable to me. So like, I thought about this a bit where I'm going to tier stuff before I started making this video, but I really thought, you know, as I uh, refresh these movies to me, um, I think I'll get a better sense of where I want to put them, what feels right. So uh, this is this is here. I think I'm going to try to order them within tiers, too. This this goes here, and then this. And then uh, this, I think. And then this. And then this. I think, yeah. I don't know. This is feeling right. This is feeling good. This. Actually, maybe, maybe this. This, uh, maybe this, and this, and this, and then this. Alright, there's my TIFF tier list. <laughs> you, you can easily convert it into star rankings if you want. Uh, but that's how I'm feeling. And then expect to see these movies discussed even more during my, my end of year list. So look forward to that. I love movies. I had a great time. See you next year. Goodbye.